Well, when you build a car with the rolling bones, it's kind of a given that you're expected to be at Bonneville because that's what these cars are all about, is driving them across country and particularly bringing them onto the salt. So, like I say, it's just kind of a given. You build one of the cars, you come to Bonneville. Obviously, I'd seen them in all the books and the magazines and stuff, but I first met them here at Bonneville in 2007. I was out here with a, a car built by SoCal Speed Shop to uh, try and beat the Seagas Coupe record at uh, 225.9. And uh, when we were here, we, we actually saw the cars, went and had a look at them, had a quick chat with them, and uh, that was a seed that was planted in my head, because to me, the car that you have to drive with Bonneville is a 32 Ford, and to me, the Bones Roadsters really, they epitomised what the 32 Ford was about, they had the attitude, the look, they, they look, they're hot rods, but they also look like vintage race cars, and they captured the essence of the sort. Dennis Varney, my buddy here, one year, this is about four years ago, four to five years ago, he said, hey, I've met these guys from the Rolling Bones. They've got some cool cars at Bonneville, and he met him. And he says, I'm going back to a garage party. I'm getting a bunch of guys in February. You know, we're in California. Go to February to, to, to uh, New York, and we get off the plane at midnight, and it's 18 degrees. So we go to this, this, this very fancy garage party at the Rolling Bones where we had Bud and Pizza and the coolest cars in the world. I go, Jesus, I just stepped, you know, it's a, it's a time warp. You know, another guy came out one time, he says, where's their building with all the good equipment that they build these things with? I says, what you see is what you get. You know, the first year, the back part of the shop was all rock, you know, they didn't have it all submitted in. Rolling Bones, I met him through Dennis Barney. Uh, I saw his car, I liked it. I met him in the uh, LA Roaster show, like in 2004, they were building. Petit's car, I went to uh, the garage party that night, which was uh, quite a party. <laughs> we partied hard and we started talking about building a car. Ended up in building this car that I'm driving today. To us, what a pure hot rod would be. Um, just trying to emulate the, the soul of one. Uh, I mean, to us, as corny as that might sound, they're like living creatures, um, and they have a personality, and they have a, you know, they, they have a feeling about them, and, and basically we're trying to build a car that starts the story and, and allows you, because your imagination is limitless, it allows you to finish the story, as, make the car as fast as you want, or end up wherever you want. and and. I guess that's what we try to build. We don't try to build a car that looks old and beat up. Nine out of ten guys that are into the car deal will know our cars. We've been accused of building cookie cutters, and that's from someone who obviously doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. But I mean, our, you can tell if our group of cars are scattered, you know our car. Or anybody that's into the cars, like that's that's a rolling bones car. That's a rolling bones car. It's just you know they just have that look the feel. We were ready to go to Bonneville, but we had uh, arranged for all the cars that we had built at that point to meet us there or go on the trip. And I think there was something like eight or nine cars with us. Yeah, the night before we're leaving, Jorge was driving his car up and down the street just to get a feel for it because he's only driven it, you know, probably 10 miles around town here. We were leaving 6 o'clock in the morning on Saturday. Jorge's driving his car down the street and we're looking at the wheel and it's wobbling like crazy. Someone just happened to see him. We're all hanging outside, eating a chicken wing and having a beer. And someone told Jorge his front, well, I think it was left front wheel was kind of wobbling. So we pulled him in the shop here and it's probably eight o'clock at night now. We pulled inside and checked it, it's jacked up, spun the wheel, sure enough, it's figured it's got a bent wheel. So we threw one on it from the back room and uh, same thing. Jacked the car up and spun the wheel and the thing is wobbling and we thought, no, it must be a bent rim. So we took the wheel off, put another one on, same thing. So we investigated a little further and determined we spun just the brake drum and we could see the brake drum wobbling. And we realized that the brand new aftermarket drum was about 30 thousandths off. The, the face of the drum that the wheel mates to was just was 20 or 30 thousandths out of true. Luckily, one of our buddies that was here, Ricky Rudolph, does machine work for us. 
So he ran it up to his house, faced it off, brought it back. Now we're pushing midnight, we get it back in the car and it's, it's, it's true and put the wheel on it, it's true and we're good to go and Jorge's on his way to his hotel room about 10 miles south of here. And so we got it all back together about 12, one o'clock that night and took off six o'clock in the morning the next day. Saturday morning, we all meet at a coffee shop, we grab a coffee and fuel up. I believe there's only two brand new cars on that trip. Jorge Zaragoza, it was a 32 three window with a blown flat head. And uh, Jorge was a little later than everybody and we start worrying. And Jorge shows up and uh, said, hey, I, I, I had to get a jump start this morning, my car wouldn't start. And we checked out a little bit and determined it wasn't charging. Well, it's a brand new car, you know, and uh, we had a few problems, like with the alternator, it burned down. Brand new power gen, decided not to generate anymore, so he started going dead. You know, we weren't too worried about it. We were gonna, we'd get a new one on the road in Speedway, which is a couple days away. Um, his car runs off a of magneto for ignition, so we weren't too worried about the battery power. I'm the life support part. Oh, yeah. It's not my fault. No, it's his alternator. Jorge's alternator is the one that went. Just figured we'd get him going down the road and stop and change batteries out of Ken's coupe, put the dead one in Ken's car, give it a jump start, let him recharge it. It was fun, you know, in a way doing that. I was telling uh, Ken all the time, well, it's time you give this how do I transfusion of uh, energy because it's not going to move anymore. So we had a little bit of problem with that, but it wasn't a big deal. Probably like every other gas stop or whatever, we'd, we'd change batteries. And... It was also uh, rubbing on the, one of the, on the louvers on the side of the hood too, and we addressed that later on in the trip when we got the new generator. Other than that, you know, this car has worked pretty, pretty darn good. to be changing batteries. Every time we had a, a stop for gasoline, we had to put a new battery into it from a Kent's car. Us Bostonians gotta keep away. Yeah. Typically when we build a car, the owner will fly in a day or two before uh, drive the car around the block a few times and then take it on three or four thousand mile trip all the way home. I flew back there and got there Tuesday night prior to us leaving on Saturday. They just took the car off of, off of jack stands, you know, and, and another quote all the time you hear back there from, from Dennis. We're at boot camp 
And and when you build a car like this, you're going to have problems. And and the car was just stunning. I said, God, this thing is it's just right. And, and there's a saying, you know, you can teach a lot of things, but you can't teach cool. It's either there, you got it, or you don't have it. And they definitely got it. And this this was very cool. Sometimes things break. It's a brand new car. We we uh, put a few miles on it, but. You know, the highways that you travel on today were potholes and the construction and so on. We're almost in Perrysburg, and I think Dick stopped him a couple of, and Ken and I were behind him, and he said he heard a clunk or something, and we noticed that the tension and spring for the, for the friction shock was off the car, so we're, we're looking around, we're combing the side of the street looking for it. So what we did was we took the spring and the bolt and the arm off of the Poteet 55 car, which was in the trailer at that point. The tensioner and the friction discs were gone. So we I think we borrowed the shock arm off the Poteet car because they're pretty interchangeable. And if I remember right, we didn't have any friction discs with us. But we looked through the toolbox and we used a couple cutoff wheels, used them as the friction material. and. Got him back on the road. Yeah. Oh, the T. T. Oh, your T. Yeah. Oh, I'm <laughs> sorry. I kept getting looking for a tool. Ah, um, I'm still asleep. This is what keeps him going, hot T. The first day is like 600 miles, and the second day is another 600. Jim built the engine for Dick DeLuna's car, and so Dick kind of kept Jim close to him just because he was a little nervous about you know driving the car. We always joke to these guys that come here and, and, and leave with a brand new car, like, we'll have it finished by the time we get to Nebraska or Wyoming, you'll be all set. Jim kind of stayed close to, to Dick, and Dick thought it was running a little rich, so he had Jim rejet the carbs. Probably something to do with the different altitudes between here and there, too. But Jim jetted them up, cleaned it up a little bit, and he was good to go. On that second day, we end up at Altoona, and there's usually 30 or 40 hot rods there waiting for us and the grills come out and the beer comes out and guys are coming in and out. It's like a whole time cruise in. And at that point, everybody's car was working except for Jorge not charging. We woke up in the morning uh, on Monday morning ready to go to North Platte and Dick had a flat tire. It seems like we get three or four flat tires along the way. We tend to run these old style new tires, and I'm not sure they're meant to do the kind of driving we do with them. Cross country, cruising 75, 80, 85 miles an hour, you know, it's hot and they seem to give out. So uh, we're always prepared. We have the spare tires and tools and jacks, and we just swap tires until we could get it fixed along the way. So pretty much breakdowns have always been not a terrible problem. Sometimes they're kind of fun to talk about afterwards, even though they might be a pain in the neck while they're happening, but uh, they happen. 
It's from the center out, isn't it? Yeah, basically. From there, on the third day, we would go to Marquette, Nebraska. First, one of our guys stopped at Speedway, picked up a new power gen. We went on, the main group went on, to Dennis Shams' shop. Our tradition now is to go to Marquette, Nebraska, to, to Mayor Dennis's house. He's the mayor of the town there. Um, puts on a world-class barbecue and all kinds of good stuff for us. Dennis is an old-time high rider. He's got this shop that's in an old Ford dealership from 1914, I believe. Usually 30, 40 people there. It's a good place. If we have a problem, he's got a garage, a shop, fully equipped shop, with another shop in his backyard that belongs to his buddy that we utilized, again, on Jorge's car. The new power gen showed up and we changed that and we took the hood side off and pounded a little bubble in the uh, hood side for clearance and stuck it back on the car. And The belt must have been a little on the long side to, to adjust the power gen out to get the tension on the belt. Fins are just clicking on his hood. So we took the hood side off and, and hammered a clearance bubble in the hood side. Stuck it back on the car and we went from there on to North Platte that night.
when we were at Dennis's shop, Gary Hedman, Street Rod Association president for that chapter in Nebraska, so he presented us with a with an award for driving our hot rods cross country and making this trip year after year, and gave us an award for driving our cars across country. We recognize those people that drive them with an award called a Drive It Award. And we thought if there'd be some way that this could make it back to Absolutely. New York. Cool. Which we have hanging up in the shop on the wall. Uh, Gary usually goes with us to Bonneville also. He, he's become uh, Keith's belt man when Keith races his 32-3 window with the Y block in it. He's became a good friend and actually a helper to me on my race effort on my car. He's an ex-drag racer, so he, he packs my parachute and makes sure my belts are tight and snugged in before the starter does his torture to me with the belts. I don't think so. I mean, this thing's making power down here yeah. somewhere and sending it up, right? Yeah. Yeah, run it over. It's like, oh, yeah. Never mind. You get it? Fuck yeah. So, bitch. You got, you got shocked? Yeah, I got shocked. Well, it's a good thing. It is a good it thing. It's just making power. The, uh, well, what we see in the it's board, though. Let really me pull the cap off the other motor. When you're driving cars cross country, uh, two of them being cars that were you know, maybe at 100 miles on them, brand new cars, things sometimes will break. Sometimes you'll go on the whole trip and nothing will happen. Sometimes it just seems like one little thing after another. And when we left Whiskey Creek, Jorge's coupe got about halfway back to the Motel 6, which is maybe half a mile, and it quit. So the boys pushed it in the parking lot. It was raining out, and we covered everything up, went to bed. Got up the next morning and took the top off the mag and noticed that the electrode had just disintegrated. Yeah, you can see where it looks like there's yeah. a spring in there, where that yeah. spring loaded, so something is. Okay, I'll see where it went. I don't either. Unless it got ground up, maybe that's what that dust well, is in there. That's what we're just talking about. Okay. It's the only explanation. Brand new mag. Brand new aftermarket part again. Luckily, we're usually fairly well prepared. We just took the cap off the uh, race car, stuck it on Jorge's car, and away we went. morning we get up and our first stop will be uh, Village Inn on the intersection of 25 and 80. Our lunch stop in Cheyenne at the Village Inn restaurant started when we got a call from a potential new customer who lives in the Denver area. Um, he said I want you know I'd like to talk to you guys about possibly building it. I think at first just a chassis then it evolved into a full car but usually again there's 15, 20 cars waiting in the parking lot. We stop there for lunch every year. I think we have a little bit of an altitude. Our 
friend Dave Scroggs who has an orange tree window that we built. He meets us there and <clears throat> tags along, joins the group. We live in Denver, Colorado, so we just shot up north on I-25 and met him at I-80 in Cheyenne. He said, I live in Denver. He says, you guys must go through Cheyenne. There's a there's a little restaurant right at the intersection. I can come up off 25 and meet you guys. And we looked at the maps. Yeah, it looks good. So we made arrangements to meet him there on that on our way there that year. I don't don't ask me what year it was, but found out about Keith and Ken in Street Rider magazine and really liked the style of car they built. Contacted them to get the build going in 2008. Well, when you build a car with the rolling bones, it's kind of a given that you're expected to be at Bonneville, because that's what these cars are all about, is driving them across country and particularly bringing them onto the salt. Yeah, we went by. Well, there were two cruisers there. There was a guy with a radar and then the chase car. We pulled into the Cheyenne. My nephew Casey was already there with the black two-door, and I saw he had his back seat out, and I was kind of wondering what was going up with that, and he had kind of a frustrated look on his face and I walked over to him he says my gas tank's leaking his gas tank started leaking seam on the gas tank split and uh, it's aluminum tank and just from all the rough roads and whatnot the lower seam had split you know it was just trickling out but it was it was leaking but you know everybody tries to help someone has a problem everybody tries to help which is sometimes a little overbearing and frustrating but somebody had told us that if you rub ivory soap on it the gas will stop which it does believe it or not i think a waitress back at the restaurant overheard us talking when we we're at lunch she says i have ivory soap at home she says i'll go get it while you guys are reading and she did as the car moves it it, you know, it just moves a little bit, and of course it opens up, so... Didn't make it, you know, five miles before it started trickling again. The, the ivory soap works, but not under turbulence. He had his friend sit in the back seat and rub ivory soap on the gas tank all the way from Cheyenne to Rollins. When the tank was out, we dropped it off at Salt Flat Speed Shop. And he got someone repair it. So I think I, I replaced the tank somewhere on the way home, just... Probably had some time to kill, I had nothing to do, so I figured I'd put the tank back in it. The group of all of us, the circus as Ken calls it, headed west for uh, Salt Lake City. And we spent the first night in Rollins, Wyoming. Usually not many people meet us in Rollins. It's... People don't seem to want to go to Rollins for some reason. But by this time, there's about 40 of us, and we have grills and coolers with hot dogs and hamburgers and salads and... We just have a party in the parking lot. Ken, yes. is this breakfast or lunch? He's I'd good, like huh? to, if we could be quiet, can okay. you? <laughs> I'd like to be there, try to get yourself there by 8.30. That means you should leave here around 7. And the reason why is this kid, Chris, at the Salt Lake Speed Shop, is putting a lot of effort in this party. And he wants the Rolling Bones cars in the, the 10 of them in one group in front of his shop, and then he has a spot for the rest of us. And the second night we spent in Orem, Utah, and actually went to Salt Flat Speed Shop for a little impromptu car show there. <laughs> Last night on the road going to Bonneville, we stop at Orem, Utah. We have a friend out there, Chris Davenport, who runs the Salt Flat Speed Shop. There's another great party. I bet you there's 50, 60 hot rods there. Uh, he saves the spot for us. We come in and park, and it's, it's just another great party along the way. If there's 13 cars, how are you going to make a 12-month calendar? I'm not making a 12-month calendar. What? I'm not 
I'm making a 12 month calendar. We're making a 13 month calendar. I'm thinking about making a 26 month calendar so we can sell it for several years. On Wednesday morning when we left the Outlaw Cafe for breakfast, we noticed that Poteet's 32.5 window that Keith was driving was not charging. And then again, brand new one wire alternator um, quit. So we got another one at a local shop and they only had a two wire one and put that in and that wasn't working right either because we didn't have it wired quite right. We drove it that way till we got to uh, Orem that night and then figured out how to wire that. and. From there, we were good. about 125 miles to go to get to the Salt Flats exit um, and we all gather up at the truck stop which is just off the highway and get a cold drink gas up or whatever Yeah, we uh, managed to uh, lose an inner tube on the right rear, and we were lucky that uh, the bones always travel with a chase trailer, so they managed to provide us with a, a spare. got into town, we put another tube in the right rear tire and that's all good. I wonder if it knocked the valve stem off. Because I don't see a valve stem. We no longer have it. We knocked the valve stem off. It's pretty early in the beginning of the speed week at that point, so we get there and... We go right to the salt flats. Um, Usually gather up at the uh, truck stop, which is just off the highway. And once we get our whole crew together, because it's pretty hard to keep that many people in, in one group, um, and we head out onto the salt flats and just pick a spot and uh, start setting up camp. Try to pick out where we're going to set our pits, which is basically always the same place. It's just, <laughs> I don't know how, you, how I know, but it just feels like it.
Bonneville is basically kind of the early day birth of speed trials. Back in the early days, everybody was modifying their cars and they needed a place to find out just how fast they could go. And Bonneville was a perfect place, being several miles long, smooth and flat. Back in the early 40s, SCTA formed out here and sanctioned the race and brought it up to what it is today, one of the largest land speed gatherings in the world. And it's a very special place. I do a lot of a, a track racing at Laguna Seca, Sears Point. It's all become very commercialized. So you drive in and there's big sponsors here and big sponsors there. You come here, it's all volunteers, and maybe you find a guy selling a little stuff over here or somebody. You don't see big tents with major corporations all over the place taking over this hobby. So whether the guy is the local plumber in Madison, Wisconsin, or the guy has his own jet coming out of LA, they're all equal. itself well <laughs> it's one of those things Ken ran me up a few months ago and they were getting all the cars ready for a trip and they were running a little bit short of time so he suggested that it would be a good idea to run the roads throughout here on zoomies well when you're on the other side of the Atlantic and it's a quick phone call on a Friday afternoon <laughs> you know you kind of agree to anything anyway but when I arrived and we switched it on my god it was loud so I've been driving that car I drove that car five days out here and I'm deaf as a post I go to bed each night and my ears are ringing <laughs> So we arrived at Wendover and the first thing we did was turn up to tech to the pits, stripped the car out, off came the roof, out came the interior, in went the cage, the fire system, seats and harnesses, etc. Next thing was to swap the motor out. First of all, we tried the uh, the engine with the three twos. All right. Let's take a break. You have up on ramps. We get the race cars out and put the race car tires on them and get them all set and we take them over to Tech and try to get that out of the way right away. Tech is a nightmare and you know it's sort of like going to the proctologist you know you just you dread it because they're got to find something wrong so they can write something down in your book that you got to fix next year. Pinholes and stuff down here. 
So you look, all you gotta do is okay. stick your head in there and look up okay. with the hood up. Yep. And if you can see daylight, we'll fill the hole. Okay, we'll do it. We got to stop. Oh, yeah, if you look in your rule book, the one uh, the, you know, the flat, uh, flat stock 45 SFI padding yeah. right behind your head here. Alright. So take your seat cover off and get a block of it and put it right where the helmet okay. goes. You know, a block like that, like a 4x4. Four four. Yeah, you got some more fresh air vents here going through the firewall that need to be addressed. See the belt here? Yeah. Now, is this firewall sealed yeah. against the body on the other side? Yes. You're going you're gonna to get your balls burnt and from here. Honest to God, we had it that way before, and last time they said no, <laughs> go to your feet. You still got to steer that thing. Can you reach the top of the wheel? With great difficulty. For so driving from the bottom of the wheel? Yeah, okay. Good. Yeah, just one thing to remember stick them belts before you try and go forward. Stick the belts because those buckles will jam right there. Fortunately, we've always passed tech pretty much with flying collars um, and once we get that tech done then it's just relax the pressure's off I think it happens to everyone you go as a, a spectator next thing you want to do is you want to go back and race something and then you want to go race something faster and, and then that just keeps evolving I got my 32-3 window that I've always driven there and out of nowhere I says I'm gonna race this car and I kind of went overboard and you know, I just thought I was going to keep it a street car, like the Roadster. I mean, the Roadster was a little easier to do that with, with the cage, you know, coming in and out and whatnot. Unfortunately, my car has evolved into just a race car right, at this point. Um, but it's, you know, it's easily undoable, which I will do someday. But I'm having too much fun just racing it right now. Well, my partner, Keith, uh, a little younger than me and probably a little more immature, he's got a 32-3 window that... Uh, he decided he wanted to race. Going 130 miles an hour is a little too slow for Keith. Seeing as that we've gotten tickets going close to 100 on the street. Did you build that pan, Ted? Did you build that? Did you build it? Yes. It's just got regular kickouts on both sides? No, just this side. Okay. And then it's got a door on the... Uh, front of it to keep the oil from sloshing forward under a hard okay. stop. That looks good. Yeah, you know, if I was going to go 160, 170, I'd have been happy. In the first year I went 175 and change. You know, I was in touch a lot with a guy named Ron Jolliffe, who's an inspector and a hot router, just an all around good guy who used as like a, a helper over the phone. He lives at the time in Idaho. You mail him a picture of a roll cage, you know, mock-up. Is this good? Is this, yeah, I just changed this and you're golden or, you know, whatever, so. By far the most common fires we have yeah. are uh, rods coming out the side of a block. Right. And that ain't gonna happen. you got some pretty good, pretty good rods. And, and you got a Moldex crank in it, really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Friday morning, we get up, we go back out on the salt and tinker around with the cars, and you visit your friends that you race with over the years. And Dennis, the, the, the compass was used in a B-29 over Tokyo at 45. This was over Berlin in a B-17. You know what you need to do is go down to the Golanay uh, air hangers and uh, get some stuff down there, because there's <laughs> stuff laying around. Yeah. Saturday morning is a little different. Thanks when things get a little more serious.
Well, what's your speed? 153. No shit. <laughs> Holy fucking moly. Yeah, right. 153? I, I thought it was like 104. I, I, you know, I didn't feel that fast. Oh, I mean, just because it felt so good. Yeah. Easy and smooth. That's great. Yeah. That's real good. Of course, once you step into the water, pretty soon you're right up to your neck. He got a hold of Ted Eaton, and who's kind of a Y block guru down in Lorena, Texas, and they put together a pretty stout Y block, and you know, not really knowing how fast it was going to go, uh, he started running in the high 160s before he knew it. And uh, I said, "Don't worry, I'll keep it under 175." He says, "Well, maybe we can make an adjustment for you." So. <laughs> I think that sounds like 175 is going to be a... Uh, sounds pretty uh, uh, pretty attainable. Yeah. Maybe like within three more passes. Got a calculator? <laughs> uh, uh, back at the pad in the toolbox. Yeah, I brought it for that. Say, uh, I brought it for that I, reason. I can do the math real fast. I'll tell you what it is at any RPM you want yeah. or whatever you want at this point. Now that we got two Thanks. numbers. Yeah. Yep. Our friend um, who's an inspector and a starter there, Ron Jolliff, said, uh, plug those four holes you got in that grill shell up and you'll go about five or six miles an hour faster. Horsepower is one thing, but you have to, you have to cheat the wind. Uh, that's as important as anything. And well, sure enough, you went from 167 to 175 by covering those holes up. The next thing was uh, to swap the motor out. First of all, we tried the, uh, the engine with the three twos. Uh, that, that ran okay, but uh, not as quick as we quite liked, so we swapped that over and we've just now put the, uh, the big motor in, the 304 with the four barrel on it. Best speed to date with that is uh, just over 125. We're playing around with jets and stuff, and the target is 130. Whether it'll make it or not, I don't know, but um, it doesn't really matter driving this car. When you're sitting there, uh, you may have the fire suit on, you may have the helmet on, you may have the Hans device, but when you sit in that 32 Ford, and you look down that Louvre bonnet, and you look out across the sword, the years drift away. It, it could be 1949, 1950. It is a complete time capsule driving that car. Well, good or no good? No good. I don't know whether that was me. Not finding third, or we lost drive, or what? I don't know what happened there. I don't think I'm, whether it's me not finding third, or nothing's going to happen. But I put it in third, I put it in fourth, and nothing. It wouldn't Just, go. Well, there was no, no. I like had no clutch. Put it in first gear. Put it in any gear. In first now, right? Yeah. You got That's first gear. Now put it in second gear. Now put it in third. I'll put it in fourth. No. Put it in fifth. We had it in fifth right before. Well, let's take it back to the pit because it ain't going in. T5 trannies, the shifters don't have a manual stop, and if you can over shift them and jam them, and you know, he was jammed fourth gear and, uh, you know, so it was stuck and forth, and, and not just stuck and forth, but, but something either broke or grenaded inside the tranny. John Suckling was racing his Roadster, and uh, again, it, that, that's a street car that races at Bonneville, and it has, a, it has a T5 transmission in it, and they're not race transmissions. And he, you know, he was a little excited, and he slammed it into fourth gear a little harder than he should have, and uh, broke something. So he got it back to the pit, and diagnosed it to be in you know the bad tranny so we're thinking wow oh, chris we call chris back in salt lake who's you know 125 miles away 
Uh, we're doing okay, but we need an S10 transmission, 90, 86 to 93. Do you got any leads on one where we could grab one? He's got one in the sedan. I saw it. You got the one from your sedan. You want to sell it? How much? Well, they're probably more than that now. Yeah. Okay. We, can we send a guy to get it? We got it back to the pit and uh, figured out it was fourth gear was gone in the transmission. And again, we made a call back to Chris Davenport at the Salt Flat Speed Shop. Yep, I got a transmission here. You guys can have it. He just happened to have a, his his own personal project car, his 32 two-door he was building, with a, with a T5 sitting in it. And he said, you guys are more than welcome to it. You know, just replace it you know, when you can or buy it off me or you know, whatever. But sure, come get it. So We sent a guy back to Salt Lake City, and he grabbed the transmission and brought it back, and we put it in the, back in the car, and away we went. We had a guy go to the three-mile, decide to drive to the four, then he made a U-turn on the course and drove back to the two. Really? Today? Yeah, and then he turned out the wrong way. That was a 10 minute screw up for us, you know? Did everything wrong. Yeah. And you come out here, and no place on earth can you look for miles and miles and see this salt. And you know, last night, we had a tremendous rainstorm coming in, quarter to six this morning. God, there's water, it's a mess. Now it's dry, gets a little crust on it. As long as the flags aren't waving, you know, these guys are going for it again. And there's no place else they can do it. Going 175 is quite a, a bar to set because that puts you onto the long course. You get your 175 wings. It's, it's sort of a milestone. And especially in a really, basically a street hot rod, a 32 three window coupe, which is a brick, and with a vintage Y block motor, uh, that's really doing something. But it's never fast enough. So Ted Eaton and Keith have found a little bit more horsepower and a little bit more horsepower and Keith has managed to streamline his car a little bit more and a little bit more but basically we're still talking about a, a heavily chopped full body 32 three window high boy with uh, old suspension um, you know buggy springs and friction shocks and the whole thing and he actually is now gone 188.563 and is documented to be the fastest Y block powered car in the world. Yeah, about six and three quarter. It's six and three quarter. Okay. So I know we're talking about it. Yeah. yeah. Check, check it off the list. While exactly. We're no, we got a big list of stuff. We're discussing things to do, and that's. Yeah, that's Something you ought to do every day is just check fuel pressure. Yeah. When I first started running the car, we kind of put something out in the ham about you know how fast my car went, and someone someone disputed it. Said, "Oh, well, there was a, a 57 T-Bird that ran 206 in Daytona in 1957, and that those numbers just didn't add up. You know that speed in back in '57 with what they technology-wise with what they had for a Y block at that point." So we just started asking around. The guy that built my engine, Ted Eaton, he happens to be friends with Carol Miller, who used to race on Daytona in 57. And he said, no way. So Ted, you know, he's kind of a professor. He did all kinds of investigation and, and got some, all kinds of documents that the car that supposedly went 206 in 57 went like 153 or 154. A local guy around here brought us a video of that meet we're in a documented the car going, you know, that 154 or five. So, according to Y Block magazine, it's the fastest Y Block powered car ever. And uh, he's looking to maybe tweak it up into the 190s and then hopefully possibly get it at 200. He's added a full belly pan now, and uh, we're thinking it's worth five or six more miles an hour. And so, on a good day, on a perfect run, you just might tickle that 200 mark. Again, we we put it out there that we think my car is the fastest Y block, you know, gas powered single carbureted or naturally aspirated uh, car out there, and no no one can dispute it. So so we're we're sticking. That's our story, and we're sticking to it.
cowboys used to have an expression called riding for the brand. You rode for the brand, that was it, you were all in. And it kind of follows along with what we do. We ride for the brand of the Rolling Bones High Rod Shop. We won't deviate, we won't cheapen it. Somebody calls up and offers all the money in the world to build something we don't want to build, we're not going to do it.